Welcome to section six of metabolism. In this section, we'll be discussing gluconeogenesis. Let's get started. So what is gluconeogenesis? It's a key metabolic pathway that uses non-carbohydrates to produce glucose. Non-carbohydrates include lactate, amino acids, glycerol, and propionyl-CoA, which is a product of odd chain fatty acids. It's important to know that gluconeogenesis occurs in the liver and the kidneys. But when we're discussing gluconeogenesis, it's most often with regards to the liver. This pathway is very important for maintaining normal blood glucose levels, especially during periods of fasting. Okay, with this in mind, let's discuss the pathway. This is the metabolic map provided in section one of metabolism. In this video, we're focusing on gluconeogenesis, which is essentially the reverse of glycolysis. The glycolytic pathway can be seen right here, and you can see a portion of gluconeogenesis right here. Let's zoom up on the pathway. This is a detailed figure of gluconeogenesis, which can be found in section six of metabolism. Notice that some of the reactions are reversible, as you can see by the bi-directional arrows, while others are irreversible. Also notice that some of the reactions take place in the mitochondria, and others take place in the cytosol. Okay, with this in mind, let's review the steps of the pathway. As we go through the pathway, let's assume this is taking place in the liver. The first step is the conversion of pyruvate to oxaloacetate through the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase. Notice that this reaction occurs within the mitochondria. The cytosolic pyruvate, right here, can enter the mitochondria through a facilitated transport protein. Once in the mitochondria, pyruvate can then be converted into oxaloacetate. Also notice from the figure that this enzyme, pyruvate carboxylase, requires biotin or vitamin B7 as a cofactor. We discuss this in detail in the section on pyruvate metabolism, but recall that pyruvate carboxylase is tightly regulated by acetyl-CoA. You can see that right here. We know that gluconeogenesis occurs in the liver and that the liver is primarily performing gluconeogenesis when the body is fasting. Under these conditions, the acetyl-CoA levels must be high, thereby activating pyruvate carboxylase. So why would acetyl-CoA be elevated in hepatocytes during fasting? Recall that during fasting, fat is metabolized and used for energy. The fatty acids are metabolized by the liver through beta oxidation, and an end product of this process is acetyl-CoA. So in patients who are fasting, there is increased beta oxidation, which results in increased acetyl-CoA. You can see from the figure that fatty acids are shown right here getting converted into acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA can then enter the TCA cycle, which is ultimately metabolized into carbon dioxide. But NADH and FADH2 are produced, which can allow the electron transport chain to produce ATP. So we'll show the TCA cycle producing NADH and FADH2, which are then converted into ATP. Also note that amino acids, for example, glucogenic amino acids right here, can be metabolized through the TCA cycle and produce ATP. As the ATP rises, it inhibits the TCA cycle. So the TCA cycle is inhibited. So you can see that I've drawn ATP inhibiting the TCA cycle, and this causes the acetyl-CoA levels to rise. As you can see, both inhibition of the TCA cycle and beta oxidation cause acetyl-CoA to rise, and this is a powerful activator of pyruvate carboxylase. Okay, let's do a question. An experiment is performed on mice which have a knockout mutation resulting in an inability to metabolize triglycerides. The mice are deprived of food but given plenty of water. After several days without food, the activity of several enzymes are analyzed. How will the activity of the enzymes pyruvate carboxylase and glycerol kinase likely be altered in the knockout mice compared to healthy mice? Remember that acetyl-CoA normally activates pyruvate carboxylase which promotes gluconeogenesis. Triglycerides are normally metabolized into glycerol and fatty acids, which we'll talk more about in a minute. The fatty acids are further metabolized to produce acetyl-CoA, and the glycerol is used as a metabolite for gluconeogenesis. So decreased triglyceride metabolism results in decreased fatty acid oxidation, which decreases acetyl-CoA, which decreases the activity of pyruvate carboxylase, which ultimately results in decreased gluconeogenesis. Glycerol kinase normally converts glycerol to glycerol 3-phosphate. This can then be converted to DHAP. If triglyceride metabolism was impaired, then glycerol wouldn't form and the activity of glycerol kinase would be decreased. So decreased triglyceride metabolism 
would also result in decreased glycerol, which would decrease the activity of glycerol kinase. From the map, if we were to draw in triglycerides, you could see that these are metabolized into fatty acids and glycerol. You can see that decreased triglycerides would result in decreased glycerol and decreased fatty acids. If the fatty acids are decreased, this will result in decreased acetyl-CoA. Decreased acetyl-CoA would result in decreased activation of pyruvate carboxylase. You can also see that decreased glycerol would result in less DHAP, and one of the enzymes involved in this process that's not shown on this figure is glycerol kinase. So glycerol kinase activity would be low. Okay, let's continue discussing the pathway. Okay, the next step in gluconeogenesis is shown right here when oxaloacetate is converted into malate. Notice how oxaloacetate must be converted into malate shuttled across the mitochondrial membrane into the cytosol right here and then converted back into oxaloacetate again. This is because oxaloacetate cannot cross the mitochondrial membrane. This is called the malate shuttle and this is the same mechanism whereby NADH is transferred from the cytosol into the mitochondria during glycolysis. From the figure you can see that NADH is generated each time malate is converted into oxaloacetate. Once in the cytoplasm, oxaloacetate is converted into phosphoenolpyruvate, which you can see right here. This occurs through an enzyme called phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase, or PEPCK. Also notice that this step requires energy in the form of GTP. Recall from the video on the TCA cycle that the conversion of succinyl-CoA to succinate produces GTP and this can be used for gluconeogenesis, as we can see right here. From here, phosphoenolpyruvate is converted into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate through a series of reversible reactions. From glycolysis, you should recall that the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is irreversible, so gluconeogenesis must bypass this step. It does this by converting fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into fructose 6-phosphate through the enzyme fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. We discussed the regulation of this step in great detail in the section on glycolysis. However, very briefly, recall that glucagon decreases the concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which releases the inhibition of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate on fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Therefore, the activity of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is increased, allowing fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to be converted into fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose 6-phosphate is then converted into glucose 6-phosphate, and the final irreversible step in gluconeogenesis is seen right here when glucose 6-phosphate is converted into glucose by the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. Because gluconeogenesis occurs in the liver and the kidneys, this enzyme is only present in these tissues. Also notice that this reaction is upregulated by glucagon, which makes sense. When the body is in need of glucose, glucagon is increased, which then increases the activity of glucose 6-phosphatase. Finally, notice that a deficiency of this enzyme, noted by the star right here, results in von Guericke disease. We discuss this more in the video on glycogen metabolism. Okay, also notice how all of the metabolites shown in the green boxes enter the pathway. We discuss the pathway starting from pyruvate, and we can see that lactate and glucogenic amino acids, right here, such as alanine, enter the pathway here. However, some other glucogenic amino acids, as well as propionyl-CoA, which we can see right here, enter the pathway at the TCA cycle. Glycerol, right here, is particularly unique because it enters the pathway right here, which bypasses many of the earlier steps. Finally, notice that fatty acids are metabolized into acetyl-CoA, but these are not mentioned as substrates for gluconeogenesis. This is because acetyl-CoA is a two-carbon molecule, and the TCA cycle metabolizes this into two carbon dioxide molecules. 
So I've drawn two carbon dioxide molecules leaving the TCA cycle. Therefore, acetyl-CoA provides no net increase in carbon molecules to the TCA cycle. So it cannot be used to produce a net increase in oxaloacetate, which is the first substrate used for gluconeogenesis. Okay, with this background, let's apply this information with another question. A 17-year-old male presents with a two-month history of weight loss, depression, and a red blistering rash primarily affecting the legs. Two days ago, he developed a DVT. On physical exam, he has a rash consistent with necrolytic migratory erythema. Labs reveal hyperglycemia. How will the activity of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase and glucose 6-phosphatase likely be altered in this patient? Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this patient has a clinical presentation consistent with a glucagonoma. Recall from pathology that this is a pancreatic tumor that produces excess glucagon. Glucagonomas result in several symptoms, which can be remembered with the letter D. Dermatitis. We can see from the question stem that he has a rash. Depression. Declining weight. He has weight loss. Diabetes. He has hyperglycemia. And DVTs. Okay, let's pull up the overview figure to answer this question. As you can see, glucagon decreases the concentration of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate by increasing the activity of this enzyme here. So decreased fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Because this normally inhibits fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, the activity of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase is increased. This results in an increased conversion of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. So the activity of fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase will be increased. And you can also see that glucagon increases the activity of glucose 6-phosphatase, so increased glucose 6-phosphatase activity. Recall from the question stem that this patient had hyperglycemia, which should make sense. The liver is working in overdrive to produce glucose for the rest of the body, even though this is unnecessary. The excessive activation of gluconeogenesis results in hyperglycemia.